All right, so I assume sounds good. Am I good? All right. Thanks, everybody. Good to be here, and I'll wrap things up. So um, I've probably done, I'm guessing, just a guess, I've probably done maybe 50 programs on LRP insurance over the last five or six years. And prior to doing those, I did a lot of programs on, on futures and options. And I was pretty excited when LRP, when LRP first became available because it was the first thing I had that I could talk about that really made sense for most operations I work with that, frankly, are not big enough to move truckloads feeder cattle. Now, I'm not naive. A lot of you in this room are big enough, and, and I think it's an option for you as well. But the flexibility of LRP and the fact that it can be utilized in any scale, to me, is what makes it most attractive. So, again, I, I've done a lot of these. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and stay... I, I'm going to try and stay very high level in the beginning, but then pretty quickly I'm going to jump into scenario. And I've, I've always felt like I could teach things better by actually walking through an actual scenario. So I'm going to apply LRP to a stalker scenario for uh, summer of 2023 to kind of illustrate the point. So what you need to know, who's heard of LRP first of all? Reason you're good, okay? So, so it's out there now, all right? Um, it's an insurance product that's designed to protect you against cattle prices decreasing. It's been around, I don't even remember, I think it's been around since maybe 2008, but it's been made much more attractive over the last few years due to some significant increases in the subsidy on the premium. Um, I want you to certainly understand this. It's an index insurance product. Any indemnity or payment you might receive from LRP is not based on what your cattle sell for. It's based on changes in the CME feeder cattle index. As a producer, if you buy LRP, what you're really doing is you're buying an insurance product that's going to pay you if the CME index is below a certain level that you choose on an ending date, a specific date. Okay, And where you choose to set that target is what we're going to kind of call your coverage level. And if you've ever used put options or know how they work, it's very, very similar to a put option. In fact, they're, they're analogous from a risk management perspective. In fact, LRP is really based on actual futures and options mm -hmm. trades. You, you good, Chris? Oh, thanks. Sorry about that. Now, so to understand LRP, I want to make sure you understand what the CB index is. Not because you're going to, not because you're going to have to know it as you work through the product, but I want you to understand what it's actually priced based on. It's a seven-day weighted average of actual feeder cattle sales in 12 major cattle producing states. And here's those 12 states. Okay, so think Northern Plains down to the Southern Plains. Think the Dakotas down to Texas. Okay, so 12 major cattle producing states. A lot of feeder cattle move through those states. And again, it's seven-day weighted average, okay, of actual sales feeder cattle in those states that fall in this category, that fall in that weight range between 700 and 900 pounds, and they throw out cattle with descriptions by them. Okay, so if you look at market reports like me, I'm sure you all do, you, you see groups of cattle with, with designations by them. Thin, fancy, fleshy, value added, dairy, what have you. We throw those cattle out. Okay, so it's a weighted average, 70 weighted average, Feeder cattle price in those 12 states between seven and 900 pounds, think 800 pound feeder steer, okay, that nondescript category. Now, a couple more slides on nuts and bolts, and we're going to roll. Um, understand that you can cover most anything. I, they, they break LRP into two weight groups, okay? Less than 600 pounds, so think calves, light calves, in fact, okay? And then 600 to 1,000 pounds. So, being a stalker program here, I'm going to base everything on the, the upper end of that. I'm, I'm going to base things on the higher end of that. If you wanted to cover calves that are under 600 pounds, you can. There's an adjustment in price for that, but I'm going to focus on, on heavy stuff here today. Um, there are some maximums that can be covered by producer. I'm yet to meet a Kentucky producer that that's been a problem for. Okay? What I want you to focus on, though, is the last line there. I can write it on a pretty small number of cattle. And again, I, I can buy LRP on 10, 20, 30 head. And that to me is what makes it so attractive, that in the premium subsidy. So here's the nuts and bolts. Of how, uh, uh, here's how it works. So you can buy LR through LRP through a lot of different types of insurance agents. Okay, So USDA RMA has an agent locator. You can enter a city or a zip code, and, and it'll give you a list of agents within a 
you know, 30, 50, 100 mile radius so you can see who sells it. There were folks in the trade show set up today that are, you know, that want to move this product. So it's, it's being pushed more by the industry than it has in the past for sure. Every policy you will buy will have two things that are very important. First is an expected ending value, okay? And the second is an ending date, okay? So I'm going to talk here in about two minutes about applying this to a stock operation that buys calves in April and sells feeder cattle in October. There will be a specific ending date to any policy, so you might have an ending date on a policy for October of October 15th. I'm making that number up, okay? But that's the date that matters in terms of indemnification. There will also be an expected ending value, meaning what is the expected value of that CME index on October 15th, okay? And that's going to be very, very close to what futures prices are. So, for example, think about an LRP ending date towards the end of October, that's going to be very close to what the October feeder cattle futures are trading for for October. And any date in September will be very close to what the, what the CME futures price is for September. And something in, say, mid-October will probably be close to something between the September and October futures price. It'll be very, very close. So you want to choose an ending date as close as you can to when you actually plan to sell the cattle. And no, that's not going to be perfect. They're offered every four weeks, so you're going to try and find something close. The reason this matters is because the only date that matters in terms of indemnification, meaning do you get a payment, is that ending date. Point blank, if you buy a coverage level at $210 a hundredweight, okay, and the CME index is below that level, on the end date of the policy, you will get dollar for dollar compensation for that difference on every pound that you cover. Okay, that's, that's the gist of it in a simple nutshell. Now, I'm going to walk right into things pretty quickly here. Okay, so th this is as realistic as I can make it. Now, um, I hit the road yesterday. Monday was President's Day. So what I've done is really based on Friday's market close. Okay, but, but I'm actually still pretty close. Um, I was looking and, and, and trying to estimate as best I could. If it were April now, and you were placing calves into a grazing program for this summer to sell in October, normal, normal stocker program, what would you likely be looking at? Now, the October feeder cattle futures on Friday was a little over $2.12 a pound or $2.12 a hundredweight. Okay, so I'm just going to round that to $2.12. That would likely be about the expected ending value of an LRP policy with any date in October. Are we good so far? you will have different options in terms of coverage level. I've grabbed three here for illustrative purposes. Okay, so for example, I could buy a coverage level, I, I probably could, could buy a coverage level around 211, but that's going to be pretty expensive. That's going to cost me about five bucks a hundredweight. If I assume I'm going to be selling 800 pound feeders in October, that's 40 bucks a head. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty significant cost. But again, do you understand how far does the market have to drop before that kicks in? It's just about a dollar. Okay, so that's what you might call a very low deductible insurance policy, right? Coverage kicks in pretty darn quick. Okay. Similarly, I could buy coverage level at 208. Now I've got to self-insure a bit more. Now I've got to self-insure about four bucks a hundred. That's going to cost me less, right? There, there's less chance I collect on a 208 than a 211. That might cost me three bucks a hundred weight on 800 pound steers. I, my premium cost is 24 bucks a head. And if I want to spend less and have more of what you might call, I hate to use the word catastrophic, but if I wanted a cheaper insurance option that's less likely to pay, all right, I might buy something like a 202 and based on my best guess on Friday, that would cost something around a dollar a hundred weight. So it might cost me about eight bucks a head. But again, if I buy that 202, I get no help on the market side until what happens? That ending value goes from 212 down below 202. Everybody good? All right. So, now, so if, if it's below 202, okay, let's say it goes to 200, okay, then you're doing indemnity of two bucks a hundred or two cents a pound on every pound that you cover, okay? So, using your example, if, if it goes to 200, 
I get two cents a pound on 800 pounds for every head that I cover. Does that make sense? So it's dollar per dollar once I get below coverage level. Good question. Anything else? Thank you. All right. So simple, rough in economist stalker scenario. Okay. I, I did this to make the math work out fairly simple. Okay. I'm going to assume I place five weight steers in mid April. Okay. I'm going to use an estimated average of the gain around one, sorry, 1.35 pounds a day. That's going to vary, folks, across the board. Okay, I'm a little conservative here. The reason I chose 1.35 pounds a day in 185 days is a very simple reason. <laughs> All right, it gets that 550 pound steer to 800 pounds come October. All right, so whatever that is, it's yours. I'm just going to keep it simple here so far. And again, we're going to assume that for October, the expected ending value is around 212. Now, understand, because the CME index is what triggers this, and it's based on the cattle in those 12 states, those of us in Kentucky and Tennessee are not going to see those same prices, right? So basis still comes into play. Now, basis is one of the most difficult things I deal with because on any given day, I can pull the market report, and I can look at a state average price, and I can find cattle 20 cents above and 20 cents below that, right? Based, first of all, on lot size, right? How many went through the ring at a time, right? And then quality and then everything else, okay? So when you think about what the end, the end value means to you, you've got to think about it in the perspective, okay, what does that mean for the kind of cattle I typically sell? Okay, so if you usually move small groups of cattle, okay, you're going to have lower lot sizes. Or you're going to have a little bit weaker basis, okay? Tim talked about moving heifers, right? Tim's got to make an adjustment here for heifers because this is based on a steer price, right? If you move large groups of high-quality cattle, your basis may be very strong. So I'm going to be fairly conservative and say that I think, you know, for, for most people that are moving groups of cattle, we shouldn't be more than about 12 bucks back of the fall board, okay? Our basis tends to be weaker in the fall, Kentucky and Tennessee both, but this should be a pretty comfortable number. Now, this may shock you, but based on an October board of 212, which by the way is about 213 and a half right now as I'm talking to you, okay, even with a conservative basis estimate, the board's saying we should move eight weight steers in groups for about two bucks a pound come fall. That ought to make you smile. Been a long time, right? That's what the board's saying. So, now, I don't want to talk about costs and returns and budgeting. I just want to let you know that I think you have to start with a simple budget framework. Okay, so don't get wrapped up in your gains too low, prices too high, calves are too cheap, health costs are too... You, know, you can talk all that stuff and that's fine, but here's just kind of my, my ruffian cut right now. I'm going to use that expected sale, sale weight of 800 pounds at 2 bucks a pound, so that works out to be about 1600 bucks. It's not exact simply due to the math here. Uh, had to round it, okay? I'm placing that five weight steer at 230. Did Larry slip out? Larry asked a question about when, when will, I think he used the word backgrounders, when will backgrounders back away from calves? Folks, the answer is when this number is not black anymore, okay? Right now, we're, we're, we're not grazing yet, right? Okay, so, you know, we're, Feed, feed costs are still driving the value of these calves. Now we're getting closer to grass. Folks, when the grass starts rolling, I think there is still a lot of room for this calf market to run. Okay? State average price for a five-way steer Kentucky last week is about $1.93. Now again, that's, that's state average. There were some over two. Okay? But I want you to understand that for the sake of today, I'm running that darn steer at $2.30 come, come April. I think that's possible when I've got a fall board as high as it is right now. Obviously, if those steer calves are cheaper come April, guess what? This number looks even better. Okay, But again, for the sake of today, I'm using a futures-based sale price of two bucks a pound, and, and I'm making an, a, a guess on that five-weight steer in April about 230. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm running pasture cost at 35 bucks an acre. That, that's low, if anything, but don't you understand what it means, okay? I'm not trying to charge pasture rent, okay? I'm thinking pretty simple pasture snare. I'm, I'm assuming rotational grazing. You're not putting a lot of P and K down. You can almost think about it this way. That's, that's probably pasture clipping and then maybe spending, you know, 50 to 70 bucks an acre every three years or so. Does that kind of help? 
So you, you know that that may be twenty five, it may be fifty a year, whatever it is. Run it. I'm running about thirty five bucks an acre. I'm going to ignore pasture rent, and I'm going to call that return a return to land capital management. But if you're renting pasture for thirty five to sixty bucks, then that's a cost you've actually got to cover there. Okay, I'm building into my return. Talking to you now. Running a quarter pound of mineral at 40 cents a pound or 50 bucks a bag, so just under 20 bucks. I've got vet medicine at 30 bucks a head. Um, sale expenses are all over the board, right? Okay. If, if, if you move groups of cattle, you know, your average sale expense is probably going to be 25, you know, 30 bucks tops. Um, if, if you're moving small groups and paying large, larger rates, that can be 50 or 60 bucks. I'm kind of making the assumption you're moving larger groups here and getting that benefit. So I'm going to run it here at about 30 bucks. I've got $15 for transportation. I've got $10 for, for things I forgot about. This is one that might be worth a quick gander here. I'm running interest at 8% a year. Okay, so operating notes have about doubled in the last 12 to 18 months. So this, this may not be exactly what you pay, but it won't be too far off. Seven to nine is probably ballpark. Okay, so... So this number has really doubled since about 12 months ago. Um, and I'm running 2% death loss ballpark. Okay, so again, I, I don't want to get into the weeds here so much, but just understand that given my expected value of the calf in the spring and a futures-based sale estimate and some, you know, some realistic assumption on, on cost, I'm ballparking a return here of about 125 bucks a head. Not a bad summer stocker return for most folks, especially of any volume at all. Obviously, every nickel more I pay for that calf, I, I shave about twenty-seven fifty off that bottom line. Every nickel cheaper I get him bought, I, I tack another twenty-seven fifty on, right? Every nickel that sale price changes on the eight weight, I've <coughs> subtracted or added forty bucks a head, right? There's the sensitivities matter, but again. Once I get that calf placed, whatever it is in a stalker scenario, what number is going to have the biggest impact on that bottom line? The answer is sale price, right? Pasture costs matter? Absolutely. Death loss matter? Absolutely. Interest matter? Absolutely. Right? But nothing's going to sway that number any more than what that sale price is. Right? In fact, if that $2 becomes about... Uh, a dollar and eighty-five cents, eighty-four cents. This return is zero, right? That's the most important number once I get that calf placed in the spring. Now, so let's assume that we sh we use what I showed you a minute ago. And we're going to say, okay, I'm going to buy LRP insurance. Ending value is around expected to be two twelve. I'm going to buy that two oh eight coverage level. That's going to cost me three bucks a hundred. I've got an expense here of 25 bucks a head. I think I'll be pretty close on that come, come spring. For something four or five bucks out of the money, you'll probably spend about three bucks a hundred. Okay, so that's a $24 cost. Another way to think about this is, okay, that's kind of like having a price floor around $1.96 minus my premium. And that comes from here. If, if I've got a 208 coverage level, and I assume my cattle sell 12 bucks back of that, that brings me to $1.96, and I'm still going to pay that 3 bucks a hundred weight. So the easiest way for me to kind of teach this is just start with this. That just becomes a cost to your stocker operation. Now, I've, all I've done is taken that exact same budget, exact same calf price, exact same sale price, exact same cost, and I've added $24 as an insurance cost. And my $125 return is, well, my, my $124 return is now about 100 bucks. And you will, in fact, make $24 less in your program if, if you buy LRP insurance. You will, right? It's a cost. Okay? You could choose to spend more, right? And then you've got a higher coverage level, okay? Less to self-insure. I could choose to spend less, in which case I've got I've to deal with more market loss before I get any help. But if you buy insurance... It's a cost. Now we're going to run through three scenarios. First one's the good one. Prices increase. So I'm going to let them increase and decrease by 20 bucks on the extremes. Okay, so I would love to see this. Let's say that LRP ending value that we thought was going to be 212 
come October is actually at 232. So it rises by 20 bucks. If that's the case, you probably sell your cattle locally for $12 back of that. They sell for $220 a hundredweight, about $17.60 a head. You're still out $24, bucks, but you don't care because you made good money, all right? You made good money. And then this is best case scenario. I've still got $24 a head cost in there for insurance, but I've added 20 cents to my sale price, right? So my revenue goes up by $160. Granted, I've got a $24 higher expense here, okay. but my return is over $260 a head. All right? I'll take that six days a week and twice on Sunday. Okay? This is best case scenario. Best case scenario is I bought LRP insurance and didn't need it. I bought truck insurance and didn't wreck. I bought Homer and didn't have a fire. Right? Best case scenario. Now, Here's, here's the most frustrating scenario, okay? This is when prices fall a little bit, but not enough to get you any insurance, all right? I no longer have a teenager. I had three four years ago. They have bumped into everything at our house, mailbox, other people's mailboxes. I replaced a garage door. We've all been there, all right? Okay? This is when you've got a thousand dollar deductible on your car insurance and, and, and the wreck cost you 600 bucks, right? You had insurance, it didn't help you, you wrote a check, right? So what if that ending value ends up being 210? Expected to be 212, you bought coverage at 208, it comes in in the middle, okay? The market dropped a little bit, not a lot. If it goes to 210, it's still above your coverage level, so there's, there's no help coming. If that's the case, I probably sell my cattle for $1.98. They sell $12 back still. I'm still out the insurance money. So the market fell, but not enough to trigger an indemnity. So my return looks like this. I've got a slightly lower sale price. I expected two bucks, I got $1.98. Still spent $24 on the insurance. And my $100 return is now more like $84, $85. Bucks. Now, again, I'm not happy about this. It's frustrating. But what's the good news? I can probably handle a small market drop, right? And that's what happened here. Market dropped a bit. I would have been better off not to have had insurance. But I probably slipped better because I had it. And I'm going to roll on. Now, here's the other extreme. Let's say instead of the market increasing by $20, bucks 100, it drops by $20 bucks 100. Okay, now, and this is why you buy the insurance. Okay, so I thought the index was going to be 212. It ended up being 192. 20 bucks a hundred weight, 160 bucks a head less than expected. Okay, big change. If that's the case, I sell my cattle for a dollar eighty, a dollar, sorry, a dollar eighty cents per pound. I'm still out 24 bucks, but in this case, Again, I've got coverage at 208. The index goes to 192. You ask this question, I get an indemnity of 16 bucks a hundred or 16 cents a pound on every pound that I covered. So on 800 pound steers, we're talking about an indemnity of 125 bucks a head. Now this is an extreme movement, but we've seen this kind of thing before, right? We have. Saw it in 15. And again, in this case, the insurance paid out, and you feel good about that. But this really is the worst case scenario. Okay, we don't want this to happen, but here's what happens if it does. Okay, the cattle sell for a dollar eighty, twenty cents less than I expected. I still got that darn twenty-four dollars sitting there. That's the cost that I had. But again, in addition to what I sell the cattle for, my indemnity comes in here. In this case, 16 cents a pound on 800 pounds a head, 128 bucks. Okay? Again, it's not as nice as it looked in the very beginning, but I still walk away with 65, 70 bucks a head return above the cost I specified. Okay? I can live to play again if this happens. Now, just for comparison, let's say the exact same, exact same thing happens, but I don't have LRP insurance. Okay? And again, I was expecting a $124 return in the very beginning. With that LRP, if the market drops 20 cents and instead of those cattle selling for two bucks a pound, they sell for $1.80, 
Notice I, I've taken out my insurance cost here now because I, I wouldn't have had it. This becomes a $35 return. Some of us can absorb that, sure. Okay? A lot of folks are banking on, you know, $7,500 head return, right? To make a farm payment, all right? To get by, to live to play again next year. So I like to kind of show these extremes. This is, this is worse, well, I should say worst case scenario. This is what you would happen with that. This is what you would see with LRP if the market dropped 20 cents between now and October. And this is without LRP, okay? More than a three figure difference. So again, it's, it's an opportunity for you to actually protect yourself on the downside. I'm going to show you the same thing now two different ways. People learn different ways. Okay, I'll show you tabular first. So I'm going to start right here. Okay, so this is that frustrating scenario. Okay, ending value went to two ten. So cattle for a dollar ninety eight. Spent three bucks on premium. Return to head was about eighty five dollars. The market drops 10 more cents, that floor kicks in, right? Once it gets below 208, the insurance kicks in and I'm kind of covered. And notice that return bottoms right there at 69 bucks. And I can feel that it doesn't matter how bad things get with that dollar for dollar compensation subject to my basis estimate, okay? The worst case scenario here is 68, 69 dollars. Everybody good? Where we see an advantage is if things improve. Okay, so if the board jumps, it goes to 220. I sell my cattle for 208. My $85 return here in a 10 cent higher market, attack on 80 bucks. $165. If I get into home run scenarios, the beauty of LRP is I've got the downside protection, but what do I still have? I've still got the upside. Now, granted, I, I'm out 24 bucks, right? If I didn't have LRP in a home run scenario, guess what? I can add on $24 there, okay? I can, but what do I not have? I don't have this downside protection. Okay, that's what you're paying for. If if if, if you're more of an analytical person, okay. Another way to show it: y-axis is your return per head, x-axis is kind of the overall market price. If you do nothing, understand that if you if the market's good, your return's really good. Market stinks, your return stinks, right? If I could forward contract or something and, and take that 125 bucks there in April, okay, then maybe I can do something like this where it doesn't matter what the market does, I'm locked in $125 profit. But LRP looks kind of like this, okay? No matter how bad the market gets, I've got a floor here around 69 bucks a head, and then I hope for the best. When I get out in this world, the difference in doing nothing in LRP in a good market is just the premium cost, right? That's the only difference, okay? When I get on the left side here, the difference in like a forward contract and LRP is the premium and then how much I had to self-insure, okay? So in our case, the assumption I made, we had to self-insure the first four bucks, right? Expected to be at 212, coverage at 208. I got to eat that first four dollars which is 32 bucks a head, right? And then I then I paid 3 bucks a head, 24 bucks or sorry, I paid 3 bucks a hundred 24 bucks a head for insurance. That's the difference here. Back to nuts and bolts, okay? Um, I do like the product. Um, this logical question, if you have to sell cattle at a different time, that's okay, no two things. Number 1, the way the policies are written, you cannot sell them more than 60 days ahead of time. So if I had bought an October 15th ending date, the earliest I could sell and have the policy would be 60, 60 days before then. Be aware of that. I can sell them any time afterwards, but again, all that matters is the ending date, right? So let's say that I sell the cattle 45 days ahead of time. That's perfectly fine. I can do that. The policy is still in force, but only date that matters is the ending date and what could possibly happen is maybe I sell the cattle 45 days ahead and the market's down. I expect an indemnity and what happens? After I sell the cattle, market runs up, right? And I don't get an indemnity. Similarly, if I keep the paddle, if I keep the cattle past the ending date, right? The same thing could happen. I might be in good shape on the ending date. I keep the cattle 60 days past and what happens? Market tanks. Okay. So again, what 
the, the take home point here is the ending date matters a lot. Give it some thought. And I get this question sometimes too. Folks will ask me, they'll say, Kenny, how do I know what coverage level to buy? And the truth is it's, it's, it's very individualized, okay? But the reason I like to start with the budget is because I want you to know, okay, if I buy different coverage levels, what does that mean for my expected return in that worst case scenario, okay? I had a good friend, he used to run seven loads of cattle a year, okay? A lot of cattle. He was able to self-insure quite a bit, and he did not do very much on the protection side. In fact, I used to joke he used his futures, his, he used his cattle for a front for a futures market speculation business at times. All right? But the truth of the matter is, he, he was perfectly fine to self-insure. He could, he could eat a loss of 100 bucks a head a couple years if he had to. A lot of folks can't do that, right? The, more, the younger you are, the more leveraged you are, right? The, you know, the, the more expenses you've got. Frankly, the, the less risk you can afford to take. So you have to kind of lean towards those higher coverage levels. So think about, you know, what's cost of production. Think about bank loan and think about can you self-insure. Um, has anybody used futures and options in the room? A couple probably. Okay. Um, I want to just very quickly talk about if you're comparing LRP to put options, I want you to understand the differences. Um, there's, there's pros and cons of both. I do think, though, even if you're big enough to use options, LRP is definitely worth a look given the premium subsidy. So that is the biggest advantage uh, is that you can buy it, buy it in any size. So those of you that move a fairly small number of cattle, you know, your, your best option is LRP. Um, the subsidy itself right now, depending on what you buy, is 55 45 or 35 percent, but even on some of the higher coverage levels that are more likely to pay, the subsidy is 35 percent. So in other words, another way to say that is you're going to pay about 65 cents on the dollar for what you would pay for a comparable put option, okay? That's why I say even some of you that are big enough to use options, you may decide to use LRP just because of that. It's going to be a little bit cheaper in, in most cases. Um, was it Tim that mentioned margin and stuff? So with, with LRP, there's no margin, no commission. And those of you that have used future and options in, in the past, you can combine LRP with other things. So if, if any of you did anything like a fence where you bought a put and sell a call, now I don't, I don't love the strategy some people do, but there's no reason why you couldn't buy an LRP position for the downside and then still write the call. Okay, so you... You can combine the two, and in theory, this should be a cheaper way to do that. I want to make sure you understand the biggest disadvantage of LRP and its flexibility. Again, in terms of indemnification, what date matters on LRP? Just the ending date. Okay? So think about something like this. Okay? Let's say that two producers are running a stocker operation. One has LRP one buys a put option. LRP is probably cheaper, okay? Place cattle in April, gets dry in June, they have to sell, okay? The one that bought LRP is basically stuck, right? Okay? They may well lose the insurance. At, at a minimum, they're going to sell the cattle earlier and not have it when they probably need it. The one that bought the put option, though, could just simply sell their put option back. Or think about the opposite scenario, okay? Let's say it's a great stocker year. I got tons of stockpile grass, and I plan to sell October 1st. And I now want to sell mid-November, okay? Again, with LRP, all that matters is the ending date. But if I'm that producer with the put option, I could always simply sell my September contract and buy in October, right? So, so there's things, so it's just more flexible. Again, due to cost, most folks are going to lean towards LRP, and I agree with that. But I do want you to understand that there's a flexibility advantage to options that you probably don't want to completely discount. Last couple things. Um, when I do risk management programs and talk about futures, options, and LRP, one of the things I, I lead with is that there's nothing wrong with simple, and I, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You can get really creative on risk management strategies, okay? And it, it's kind of fun to talk about those things. But in reality, the best strategy is the one that works for you, and sometimes that's simple. And LRP is as simple as it gets, and I like it for that reason. I always encourage folks to work through a budget like I kind of showed you, 
and then do some sensitivity. What happens if that sale price is 10 cents lower than you think? What if it's 15? What if it's 20? And if you do that and understand how sensitive your returns are to that sale price, some of these strategies kind of start to sell themselves, right? Because they're... There's a tendency for folks to look at a bottom line and say, okay, you know, I make 125 bucks and kind of think that zero is the worst case scenario. But it's not, right? Those numbers go negative. So you're not protecting 125 bucks when you buy LRP, right? What are you protecting? The entire value of the animal you're going to sell in the fall. So I like to think about always doing sensitivity around those returns. This one I've kind of learned working with producers. Set targets ahead of time. Um, something a lot of folks like to think about is, I want to price what I'm selling as I incur my input cost. So it, it makes more sense in a grain setting. Okay, so very early on, I know my cash rent. And then it's seed and planting, right? And then it's fertilizer and so on. So you can kind of think about, okay, I want to price my grain about proportionally as I incur my input cost on the grain. If I took that same logic and applied it to a stocker operation, what percent of my costs are sunk the day I buy that animal in the spring? 80 cents? Or, sorry, roughly 80% probably? It's a good chunk, right? It's a pretty darn good chunk. So we probably should be more aggressive than we are on protecting the downside on some of these cattle. And I, and I say this because, you know, sometimes you don't want to buy LRP or enter a contract or buy an option the day you place those calves, and that's perfectly fine. That's your business, okay? Maybe you want to wait and decide later. But what I always tell folks is write it down and decide ahead of time. If I can get LRP coverage for, you know, this coverage level at this price, I'm going to do it. And when it gets there, just make it happen. What happens is if you're, if you're kind of watching the market, if you're watching the market there in real time, You'll get analysis paralysis, right? And, and you'll convince yourself it's going to go higher and higher and higher, and you'll never pull the trigger, okay? So set targets ahead of time, and when they get there, move on it, okay? Don't do it in, in real time. It's nearly impossible. And then the last thing, don't get so hung up trying to get the best price or the best coverage, right? You're not going to nail it every single time. And I would argue that sometimes, you know, not doing something can cost you more than doing something too quick. In other words, if you're not leaving money on the table occasionally, you're probably taking too much risk. Okay, so don't, don't be afraid to do that. You're going to leave money on the table occasionally, and that's fine. You're also going to save yourself money on occasion too. That's the idea. Uh, James showed you cattle market notes. Monday afternoons this comes out. We would love to get you on, on, would love to get you on that mailing list. If you have trouble with QR codes, and I have a very cheap Samsung phone that can't read those, so I, I, I can relate to you. And I'm, I'm proud of my cheap phone. I, I will not pay what they charge for some of these phones. If you, if you can't read that, though, reach out to me anytime. I can get you added, or if you have any questions or, or, or want to see something, I'm more than glad to walk you through it. Time for questions? Yes. Questions for me on LRP or what I covered? Happy to visit with you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. So the minimum is 13 weeks. In theory, I can go a year out. Now, practically speaking, it's based on actual options trades. So once you get beyond, I don't know, like 28 or so, so 13, 17, 21, 25, 29, once you get beyond 25 or 29 weeks, it gets pretty thin so you won't have a lot of availability. In theory, I can go really far out, but practically speaking, this is something kind of three to eight months is kind of a rule of thumb. But you may get an offer. You may get the chance to buy something far out, and if, if, if you like it, grab it. It's just not going to be consistently there. Thanks for asking that. I should have mentioned that in the, the presentation. What else? Yeah, take it. No, and, and, and again, basis is difficult. So the, so I track basis for Kentucky cattle, right? But all I can do is base it on state average prices. Okay, so so ordinarily, so the last five years, our basis in October for an 800-pound steer was like, I think it was maybe 14, 16 cents under, okay? 
But again, that's the state average number, which includes a lot of small lot sizes, right? So you've kind of got to adjust that for yourself. So I bumped it up thinking that, okay, we're going to be moving larger lot sizes, most likely in, in this room. And the other thing to think about with basis um, is that we tend to use history, right, as we tend to use history as an indicator, but current conditions matter, right? What's diesel fuel right now running? Five-ish, am I still close? Four-something? Okay, so bad example. Let, let's say diesel was still at five and a quarter, though. Would that not make basis different this year than the last five years on average? Of course it would, right? So you've got to think about those sort of things. So what I tell people to do is think about the cattle you typically sell, okay? You know about what your cattle typically sell for. Look at what they're selling for today, and then compare that to the current futures market. So this is February, right? So if you're moving cattle, if cattle, the, if the kind of cattle you're selling are moving today at, I don't know, a, a dollar seventy-five, and the board's at a dollar eighty-six, right? There's an implied basis on those kind of cattle of eleven dollars under, okay? And start there, and then make a seasonal adjustment from there if you need to. Does that make sense? Long answer, short question, I apologize. But, but basis, basis is the tricky part, right? So think about how your cattle typically compare to the board. Yeah, Tim. It doesn't change the basis at all. So the basis is going to be what you sell for versus the board, right? Uh, I like your question, though. So I, I think Tim's question was, let's say I want to cover 500 head. Can I do it in three policies instead of one? And the answer is absolutely yes. So for example, you might want to cover a third of them really high, a third in the middle, and a third very low. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? It'd be perfectly fine. Similarly, you might say, all right, I, I, I'm going to protect a third now. Look again in a month and another third, right? So you've got all sorts of flexibility, but you just you can't have more LRP than you do cattle, <laughs> right? So, yeah, good question. What else? All right. I appreciate a chance to be here. Thank you all.